Good evening, everyone. My name is David Wood. I'm the Special Projects Manager for Early Music America, and thank you once again for joining us. If you've uh, been a part of one of these webinars in the past or an interest session, uh, and if you haven't, then welcome for the first time. Uh, we'd like to tell you a little bit about how our uh, session is going to work this, this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. And so if you haven't been a part of a webinar from uh, uh, EMA or other webinars, then you may not be familiar with the Q&A function. And so we'll just ask you to use that Q&A box to put your questions throughout this uh, presentation. And we will be addressing those as we can at the end. The presentation will be about 45 to 50 minutes long, and then we'll reserve about 10 minutes for questions at the very end. If you have any questions that come up during the program uh, that are a technical nature, you can feel free to put those in the chat uh, or other uh, things like that in the in the chat if you'd like to be uh, social uh, but we do ask that your questions be addressed through the question and answer box so that we can keep charge of that if you are joining us uh, on Facebook live please put your questions in the comments and we'll relay those over here to zoom uh, throughout the session as well you can learn more about early music America and our programming and our advocacy on behalf of the early music field in North America by visiting our website, earlymusicamerica.org. There are lots of resources. You can access our magazine, eMag. There's news, events, and much more at earlymusicamerica.org. And while you're there, you can also join EMA and support our mission through membership, or you can donate if you would like to support in that way. You can also find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And on YouTube, we'll be archiving this webinar as well as you can, uh, as well as being able to find our past webinars. There's a playlist for webinars and interest sessions. You can also find performances from our past uh, Young Performers Festivals and the Emerging Arts Artist Showcase and much more at our YouTube channel and you can also find us uh, you can also find out more about EMA by texting 42828 and putting early music in the message there and that will allow us uh, to communicate with you uh, in a variety of ways through our newsletter and much more and then you can also uh, just click the button at the bottom of earlymusicamerica.org if you'd prefer not to use the uh, text message and you can sign up for the newsletter right then. That comes out every Tuesday and includes uh, our latest CD reviews and book reviews and our featured articles about early music and much more uh, through our weekly eNotes magazine. So I would like to welcome our presenter this evening, Thomas Kelly, who is professor at Harvard, has also uh, spent time and was very instrumental at Oberlin College, uh, starting the uh, as one of the founders of the historical performance program there, also at five colleges where he was uh, the, the uh, founding director of the early music program there, um, also since at Wellesley and then times in England and Paris. And he's also a, uh, a widely published author with books and articles, a standing uh, column in our uh, Early Music America magazine, EMAG, as well. You can always uh, find out what's, what's on uh, his mind through, through EMAG. And we're very, very happy uh, to have you joining us today, uh, Tom. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it, David. Thanks for the introduction. And hello, everybody whoever and wherever you are. Uh, this is not an arrangement that allows me to see you, but I'm assuming that you're all out there and I hope this is gonna work. The, because we don't know each other, I don't know whether I'm talking to great experts who know far more about this subject than I do, or people who are looking for sort of an introduction to something. My guess is that we cover the whole range and I'll probably not do a good job of satisfying everybody, but I'll just do the best I can by talking about what interests me? How's that for a plan? Um, my interest, really, what I'd like to do is talk to you about um, the city of Mantua, which I hope you see right now. Um, this is a city uh, in northern Italy. You can see the Alps way off in the distance. Um, and uh, it's 
one of many, many small principalities run by dukes or princes, or in some cases, the Pope or the Grand Duke of Tuscany, lots of, lots of little things. The idea of Italy is a fiction that hasn't yet happened. It may be a geographical fact, but it's not a, uh, but it's not a political fact uh, in the 15th and 16th and 17th century. The real interest in Mantua, it has a long uh, history run by the Gonzaga family from the 15th century till sometime in the 17th century. Uh, a couple of wonderful places, but the one that we're interested in or that I'm interested in, and I hope you are, is that this is the place where Claudio Monteverdi worked for a good portion of his professional life. And it's the place uh, where the first performance of what I think of as the first great opera, Monteverdi's opera Orfeo was given. Mantua still uh, has uh, that funny effect of being surrounded by lakes. They dammed up the river Mincio. And if you look across the, one of the lakes, you can still see the palace of the Dukes of Mantua in the distance. Here's a bird's eye view or a drone's eye view from a modern uh, aerial photograph of Mantua. And you can see the three lakes and you can see actually the shape of the medieval city. As we get closer, you will see that, that um, U-shaped public park and almost everything to the right of the park, um, uh, all of this part in this picture is the, is the top view of the palace of the Dukes of Mantua. All those white things off on the left, that's market day in the Piazza Sordello. That's the big piazza, that's the public piazza from which you enter the palace. It's a very big complicated thing that grew over many centuries. And um, some people thought it was the biggest building in the world. How anybody knew in around 1600 how to measure what the biggest building in the world uh, was is beyond me. But anyway, it's a big complicated um, operation. To get to the palace nowadays, you walk through this, this big arch into the Piazza Sordello and you see in front of you the 18th century facade of the Mantua Cathedral straight ahead and off to the right, the part of the palace of the Dukes of Mantua, the medieval um, Palazzo del Capitano, which is how you enter the palace nowadays. The cathedral, of course, didn't have its 18th, 18th century facade in Monteverdi's day. Here's what it looked like in those days. This is the big battle that threw out the previous rulers and installed the Gonzagas. But you can see the same piazza with the same cathedral with a different front and the same, uh, the same part of the palace off on the right. There it is again. And that's how we enter the palace. Uh, through the Palazzo, Palazzo del Capitano. Nowadays, you go in through this door. The door isn't really out of focus. My camera was out of focus, but who knows? Maybe many a reveling courtier saw it this way after a night out on the town. Anyhow, the palace is full of courtyards, hanging gardens. Um, there's actually a large medieval fortress incorporated into part of the palace, the Castello di San Giorgio. There's a great big basilica of Santa Barbara, a big church built into the palace, so large that you can't really get a view of the front of it from anywhere because the palace encroaches on all sides. Palestrina actually wrote masses for uh, specific Santa Barbara masses for this church. It has big galleries. Here's a big gallery designed to display the very famous classical sculpture collection of the Gonzaga family. And that lady walking away from us a little bit out of focus is my wife, Peggy, who I think is joining us in this webinar. There's a uh, an outdoor riding ring designed to display the cavalry maneuvers and the beauties of the horses that the Gonzagas loved almost as much as they loved pretty women. And in one portion of the palace, there's the lovely little apartment that was lived in uh, by Isabella d'Este, the wonderful 15th century, 16th century lady, um, uh, who uh, lived here. here. Here's on the left is a, is a miniature of her. And on the right is the, um, is the uh, portrait of, uh, of her by Titian painted around 1535, 1536. 
in her apartment. There are beautiful woodwork. Again, this is that famous camera of mine with her name built into her little studiolo. There are one wonderful um, intarsia panels showing uh, scenes of various kinds, showing musical instruments. That idea of having um, a little study where you kept your most wonderful things. She had a lot of paintings by Montaigne. She deserves a webinar of her own. She was a patron of the arts, of literature, of music. She played herself. Um, she commissioned poetry. Um, another day we'll talk for an hour or so about Isabella d'Este, but for now we want to talk about this guy on the bottom left. This is Vincenzo Gonzaga and his wife, um, Eleonora de Medici, who are the Duke and Duchess of, of, of uh, Mantua at the time that Monteverdi was employed by them as a court musician. Um, and behind them in black, as is befitting people who have passed away, are the previous Duke and the previous Duchess. This picture is actually cut down, as you can see. This is two pieces of a much larger picture that was called the Gonzaga family adoring the Holy Trinity. But you might almost call us, us adoring the, the Gonzaga family adoring the Holy Trinity. Anyhow, it's while Duke Vincenzo was was ruling Mantua um, uh, at the height of its power. And he, like most other Renaissance princes, wanted to show his grandeur by patronizing the arts, by having a lot of horses, by being up on other people, by all sorts of things. Um, he was very proud of his court musician, um, uh, Claudio Monteverdi. And it was Monteverdi whose job it was to provide whatever music was needed. And we have a letter from Monteverdi. No, uh, we actually, we have a text from his brother who says, poor Claudio's busy all the time. He has to do jousts and concerts and, and balls and whatever they ask for. So what they asked for here was the music for a new play. And here is the um, 1609 publication of the music for that play. The title page says, The Orpheus, L'Orfeo, a fable in music by Claudio Monteverdi, performed in Mantua in the year 1607 and newly published. And it's dedicated to the most serene Lord Don Francesco Gonzaga, Prince of Mantua and, and of Monferrato, etc., printed in Venice in 1609. So Francesco Gonzaga is not Duke Vincenzo, that's uh, Francesco is the Duke's eldest son. And it was his job to put all the pieces together for the learned academy of Mantua. They were called the Accademia degli Imbaghiti. It was an association of gentlemen who got together to do literary things and write poems and put on plays and the kinds of things that rich idle gentlemen do. All gentlemen, no ladies. Um, and one of the things they did was put on a play and Francesco was in charge of putting it on. He was a member of the Academy. Alessandro Strigio, the man who wrote the, the play, the, the poetry of the play, was a member of the Academy, but Monteverdi was not a member of the Academy. He was a servant. Many of you probably know Orfeo very, very well. And for some of you, I hope, it certainly is true for me, it's one of your most favorite pieces in the whole world, maybe the favorite piece of music in the world. And everybody in the world knows how this begins. It begins with a piece that Monteverdi calls Toccata, which is played three times before the curtain goes up. <laughs> And it goes on. Music for trumpets. Now, uh, Monteverdi actually writes out the music in the score of Orfeo, which is an odd thing because normally trumpet music was not written out. It was a kind of a secret art and trumpeters kept their gills and they kept their music private and you didn't know the trumpeters music. And what I think is, what I'm pretty sure is that this is the fanfare used to announce the presence of the Duke of Mantua. The reason Monteverdi writes the music out is not because the trumpeters don't know it. For goodness sake, the trumpeters play it five or six times a day every time the Duke enters a room or wants his presence announced. The trumpeters know it up one side and down the other. But because Monteverdi says it was played by all the instruments, 
and there were a lot of instruments in the, this first performance, he has to write it out for the people who don't know the trumpet music. So we have just a peek into the secret trumpeter's art of Mantua that we might not otherwise have. Here is a, uh, a picture of Francesco Gonzaga discovered not too many years ago. It actually is a part of that bigger painting that we saw earlier of the Gonzaga family uh, adoring the Holy Trinity that, that got cut up into lots of little pieces. The painting is by uh, the court painter, Peter Paul Rubens. They settled for nothing less than the best. And Francesco's job was, as I say, to organize this play. We have a wonderful set of letters between him and his brother, Ferdinando, his younger brother, Ferdinando Gonzaga, who was off in Pisa and Florence studying. And he wrote to Ferdinando and, uh, and said, we really need some singers. I want to borrow some singers from the Grand Duke of Tuscany because we're really short and I have not much time to put on this play. And I'd really like to hear one of those castrati, one of those countertenors, well, not countertenors, castrato, high voice, male voice that we heard that from the Grand Duke. So he was borrowing singers the way you and I might borrow a cup of sugar. Um, uh, and part of the reason for that is that there were, although there were plenty of singers on the payroll, there were a lot of excellent female singers in Mantua. The Duke, Duke Vincenzo not only loved pretty ladies, but he also liked the voices of women. And he had a group of singing ladies in imitation of the singing ladies of Ferrara. But at this point, particularly for an all male academy, he did not allow his female singers to appear in public. So Everybody in Orfeo, all the parts in Orfeo were played by men, including the role of Eurydice. The role of Eurydice was played by a small uh, castrated priest. Uh, um, uh, we know his name and we know he sang the role of Eurydice. And if the role of Eurydice is gonna be played by a man, surely the whole cast was male. And that's why they were sort of hysterical to try to get some more singers from Florence, which they did. And the, uh, they borrowed one singer from Florence who came, sang three roles in Orfeo, did them very well, but apparently it was all a sort of scramble at the last minute. And probably a lot of people in early music America know all about putting on a show and how many pieces there are that need to come together at the very last minute. Well, that's what happened here too. Um, here's one of the only, only pictures we have of, of um, Claudio Monteverdi. There's an oil painting that may or may not be Monteverdi, but this is a, uh, this is claims to be Monteverdi anyway. It's actually a picture printed after Monteverdi's death. And it shows Monteverdi as a, I guess, a relatively old man. So it, this is not what he looked like in Mantua in 1607. But he probably had this same grumpy look. I mean, we have a lot of letters from Monteverdi and he's always complaining about his bad treatment. They treat me like a servant. I'm overworked. I don't get the pay. They told me I was going to, oh, that kind of thing. Um, and he had very good reason. He probably was treated badly. So at this time, as in other times, he was kind of looking around for maybe another job. Mantua was maybe a little bit too small for him. He was by now a fairly famous composer. He had published a bunch of books of madrigals, of, um, of uh, scherzi musicale and other music. He was well known all around Italy anyway, and in northern countries. So he was not nothing, even though he was a paid uh, servant to the Duke of Mantua. So this is the title page of this play. People thought they were going to see a play, and we know that it was given in the palace of the Dukes of Mantua. Here is they claim, the room where Orfeo was first performed. Well, this isn't actually a room in the palace of the Dukes of Mantua. This is actually a model about the size of a shoebox in the Music Museum in Paris, where they have scale models of a lot of famous venues where famous premieres took place. Orfeo, there's the Rite of Spring, there's Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, there are all sorts of things, really interesting display, but this is totally fictitious. Um, at the time they made this up, nobody had any idea where the, where the room in the palace was that Orfeo was first given. Since then, it's been figured out. There were letters from ambassadors 
who said uh, something about, uh, uh, we have a letter that said it was given in the apartment that the most serene lady of Ferrara had the use of. So we know it was in the apartment that the most serene lady of Ferrara, that is the Dowager Duchess of Ferrara, who was a Gonzaga, her husband, the Duke had died. She came back to live in the palace <coughs> and she was given an apartment to live in. What we didn't know is what apartment it was. A later letter from an ambassador said that it was the Camere Lunghe, uh, a group of rooms on the ground floor. And now we know where that was. And here is how you get to them. This is a ground plan of the, of the Ducal Palace given to me by the current sort of architect of the, of the palace. Um, and the yellow arrow here, if you can see it shows the entrance that you use now, uh, that the tourists use to enter the palace to go and tour it. The green line shows how you entered the palace in Monteverdi's day and how you would go to get into the room marked with an X in which Orfeo was first performed all on the ground floor. You start out in the piazza where we were before. You walk not through the Palazzo del Capitano here, but you walk through this lower building off to the right and you walk through an archway into a, a courtyard, now sort of a public garden. In the courtyard, um, you turn left and look at this building and it's the ground floor of this building, um, the, uh, above which are the famous Pisanello frescoes, but on the ground floor, the Camere Lunghe, you can see that this is an old building that's been kind of revamped more than once, you enter a doorway and instead of going through the door that you see there with the glass around it, that door leads into the corridor that the public, that's the public access into the palace. Instead of going through this doorway that you see and up those stairs, you turn right before you enter the door, you see a handsome Renaissance doorway and you think, this is so cool, I'm about to go into the room where Orfeo was first performed. This is just great. You go in and what do you see? You see a bunch of fluorescent lights, a bunch of folding tables and a bunch of people counting money and sorting out papers because this is the back office where the take from the, the sale of tourist tickets to tour the palace is done. So all of this is kind of back, op uh, back office operation. Any decoration there may once have been is long gone. But you can see the sort of vaulted ceiling. Um, you can see on the right-hand wall, the three large windows that probably, uh, I don't know what time of day the performance was given, if it was in the evening, you don't have to worry about light, but they could have been closed off. And you see down at the far end, a uh, door leading into the next room, which would be useful for um, entrances and exits for people if, they, if a stage were built down at that end of the hall. It's a small room and uh, much narrower than this. And in fact, Monteverdi says in his dedication to Francesco that the performance was given on a narrow stage. Anyway, this might do, but it's not the room, not the room we just saw. They built a, uh, some kind of a stage, some kind of a theater in this room. We know people did that um, lots of times in lots of other places. Here is a theater built well, to be a theater, this is not a temporary theater. This is a very, very beautiful theater built by Palladio for a learned academy in Vicenza. This is the Teatro Olimpico. And this stage set built by a later architect is meant to uh, model a Roman stage set. But the theater, the basic Greek idea of a big flat chorus on the bottom, a semicircular amphitheater of seats. There's a colonnade with statues and then a painted ceiling overhead to indicate that Greek theaters originally were outdoors, not indoors. Here's a design for a temporary theater built in a palace in Ferrara in 1565. And even though they're trying to imitate the hemicycle of seats, it's really hard to do with lumber. So, I, so they're, using, they're using angles instead of a semicircle. And you can see the, you can see maybe the disappearing, the, the perspective effect intended for the stage. 
Um, here's another design for a temporary wooden theater in, the, in Ferrara in 1605. Um, again, a perspective set with these little pins sticking out, probably are indications of the sliding panels that you decorate and slide in to make a complete sort of panoramic set. The set and the theater were surely, we don't know for sure, but the architect of the ducal fabric was the painter, Antonio Maria Viani. This is what his painting looks like. And he will have designed a, probably a very elegant small theater for that little room. And he will have painted the sets, the Arcadian set of trees and the beautiful landscape in which pastoral things go on, and the underworld set that has the river Styx, the entrance to the realm of Pluto and all that sort of thing. All those things that happened in the course of Orfeo. Um, it was a lot to organize. And everybody remembers, I think, what happens in Orfeo. Um, it, it works just like a classical tragedy because just like those theaters, the members of the academy imagined that they were doing early music. That, that is, they were reconstructing entertainment from the past. They, they made this play uh, in Italian, but on the model of classical drama. So it has, um, it has a prologue, somebody who stands outside the, in the, um, the action. In this case, it's the personification of music who says, you gentlemen of Mantua, draw near, be silent. I'm going to tell you the story of Orfeo. Then you have five acts, and each act concludes with a, a choral ode, music by a chorus, and that, uh, that comment on the action. They take part in the action. They also comment on it and tell us what we should learn from what we've just seen. We have long speeches and poetry. It's all meant to be like a classical drama, and it tells a famous classical myth. We all know the story of Orpheus, the, 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 the greatest musician who ever lived. What a great story to tell because one of the things they also uh, thought they understood was that in classical times, the reason Greek tragedy was so moving to the audience was that the, uh, was that the singers, the, the actors, sang their parts to the accompaniment of their lyre, the kitara. So they say, okay, we'll have them sing. It'll be great. We'll not sing, but they'll speak their lines to music and we'll, in, I don't know what a kitara was. So let's make one, but let's make a big one and we'll call it a kitarone. So they invented this new musical reciting style and the actors delivered their lines in this reciting style. There's also a lot of nice instrumental music, a lot of good straight ahead songs, but there's a lot of reciting style in this thing. It's about the greatest musician who ever lived. Good subject for a musical, uh, musicals, uh, musical play. And as you know, he falls in love with the beautiful Eurydice. She, in this telling, is bitten by a snake. She dies, and she's dragged off to the underworld where the, where the dead all go. Orpheus resolves to do what no human can do, go down into the underworld and, and fetch her back. He does so. He, he manages, he talks to Caronte, who guards the river Styx and ferries the dead across gets across the sticks, he makes a deal with Pluto. Pluto says, yes, you can bring her out on one condition. And we all know what that condition is. You can bring her out, you lead her out, but you don't look back to see whether she's following you. Well, that's why myths are so great. It's the thing we face every day. He's leading her out. He says, am I being tricked? Am I being talked into walking out of hell without her? How do I know she's back there? My heart tells me I need to know. And my head says, I just made one thing. There's only one thing I have to do. And that's just not do anything. Keep walking. Don't look back. Well, he does look back. There she is. She's drawn back into eternal darkness. He's ejected into the upper world that he once loved and is now nothing but sadness to him. Well, it's that old story and it's that same story we have every day of our lives. Um, our heart tells us one thing, our head tells us another. Do I really have to get up out of my nice warm bed and go to work? Couldn't I just stay here and sleep another hour? Well, the great thing about those ancient myths is they tell us a truth about ourselves. Anyhow, that's the story of Orpheus. He gets ejected into the upper world. There's a beautiful monologue. Almost all of Act Five is a monologue of Orpheus saying how sad he is that he's no longer with Eurydice. And he, has, he gets sort of more and more outside himself. First, he starts singing to her how beautiful she was. Then he says, 
no other woman could hold a candle to you. And then he has a kind of a mad scene where he says, all women are full of lies and vanity and they're all horrible. And not, who would ever have, women are hateful and deceitful and I'll never have anything to do. It's a mad scene. He goes from sadness to madness in the course of this long monologue. And that's fine. That's what happens. And here's the book that says, that has all the music in it. Here's the book that has the words in it. And it says, the fable of Orpheus presented in, in music in the carnival of the year 1607 in the Academia dell'Indaghiti of Mantua under the happy auspices of the most serene duke, their most benign protector. Uh, and this is, the, this is the, the poetry. This is the words that Monteverdi set to music. And what happens here is here's the end of, here's the end of, Mont of um, Orpheus's monologue. That's where he goes crazy. And this, that green part is the part that Monteverdi sets to music. And everything that comes after that is not in Monteverdi's score. Something else is in Monteverdi's score. What happens here is, uh, is Orpheus says, but here comes an enemy, a bunch of crazy ladies, worshipers of Bacchus. I'm going to go hide myself. Then there's a chorus of backhands who say, they sing to Bacchus and then they say in the course of their singing and dancing, we'll take care of him later. And that's the end of the opera. So it's a chorus of Bacchic dancers um, uh, and that's what happens. So here's Orpheus. The last six lines of this. Orpheus is mad So far, so good. And in the libretto, then he says the stuff in red, but here come those bad Bacchic women. In the score on the right-hand column, a piece of music plays and Apollo comes down from heaven in a cloud singing. That's what it says in the score. The score says, this is Orpheus performed in Mantua in 1607. And here's his score. There's the music that we just heard on the left-hand page. On the right-hand page, number two there, is the instrumental piece that gets played. And the number three there points to where it says, Apollo comes down in a cloud singing. So we got the word book that says, this is the Orpheus performed in Mantua in 1607. We got the music book that says, this is the Orpheus performed in Mantua in 1607. And one of them has a Bacchic ending and one of them has an Apollo ending and neither, they can't both have happened. So some, something's up here. And this is something that keeps musicologists up at night. You can ha have big fights with your colleagues if you're interested in this subject. Lots of people have lots of different theories, but I will tell you the Kelly theory, which I'm sure is true. And that is that the only possible ending is the Apollo ending. Uh, lots of things to be said. But one of a silly reason for this is that Monteverdi prints in his score a list of all the characters on the left and a list of the huge uh, battery of instruments that are used in Orfeo on the right. And the last of the characters uh, uh, in this thing is something that says Coro de Pastori che fecero l'amoresca nel fine, a chorus of shepherds who did the moresca at the end. At the end, in, Apollo, in, in uh, Monteverdi score, Apollo comes down in his chariot. He says, boy, you're out of balance. Get in this, get in this flying cloud. We're going to go up to heaven, and you'll be with Eurydice among the stars. He does. They fly off to heaven singing this amazing virtuosic duet. And then all the, sh the chorus, the shepherds and shepherdesses, sing a song about, there goes Apollo and Orpheus up to heaven. 
So, and then they do a dance called a moresco, which is in the score. So this says, not chorus of shepherds who should do the moresca at the end if the Apollo ending is performed. It says chorus of shepherds who did the moresca. So either Monteverdi is lying or that dance happened, in which case the Apollo ending happened. There's also this question of the amazing music that happens. The music that precedes this rubric is something that, uh, well, maybe you know what it sounds like, a very beautiful, mysterious kind of sound. And now Apollo is physically present. So that music, that's actually not the first time we've heard that music. We heard that music twice before in Orfea. We heard it first. We don't know why we heard it, but before Orpheus was about to sing to Caronte to try to talk his way across the river Styx, before he starts singing his most amazing aria, Pocente Spirito Formidabil Lume, before he starts to sing, this music plays. We don't quite know why. I mean, if you were about to give it everything you've got, what would you do? Would you kind of tune your lyre? Would you kind of do a vocal exercises? Would you do some Tai Chi? Would you say a little prayer to your father, Apollo in heaven, saying, help me do this? We don't know what that music is, but there's something out of time, something magical about it. Then he sings his, he sings his heart out. It doesn't work. Caronte says, that's really, really nice, but I can't let you across the river. My job is not to let mortals across. Anyway, he tricks you. Uh, and, and once uh, Caronte says, no, I can't let you across the river, that music plays again. We don't know why, but it's mysterious sounding. And by the time that music is over, Caronte has fallen asleep and Orpheus is able to borrow his boat and cross the river. So we've heard that music the first time. We didn't know what it was when Orpheus is getting ready. We heard it a second time. There's something magical about it. It put Caronte to sleep. We hear it the third time here when Apollo comes down in his chariot. And what, I, what I'm pretty sure is we hear that music and we say, wait a minute, this is Apollo. This music represents Apollo. Aha! Uh -huh. That must mean that it was Apollo who put Caronte to sleep. Ah! That must mean that Orfeo was addressing Apollo, was sort of thinking about or praying to Apollo just before he began to sing. Why, in fact, you know, Orpheus is the son of Apollo, and in fact, come to think of it, Orpheus's first words in the whole opera were a hymn to Apollo, rosa del cielo, vita del mondo. And so there's a sense in which this music playing here when Apollo comes down in his chariot makes the whole opera make sense retroactively. If you don't hear this music, if you do the Bacchic ending and you don't hear this music, you don't know it's Apollo, you're still not quite sure what that other stuff was and the whole thing doesn't make sense. And the third thing is that it really is about um, it's really about a Neoplatonic philosophy, if you think about it. Um, uh, that is, and that's what the myth is about. Uh, overhead is the world of balance in all things. Apollo is the god of the sun who drives the, drives the sun across the sky every day. And he's the god of music, but he's also the god of balance in all things, rationality. And under our feet is the world of Pluto and Proserpina, the world of the passions. When Pluto and Proserpina talk to each other, all they can do is think about sex. She says, if you really love me the way you said you loved me when you snatched me down here, you'll let this lover Orfeo take his beloved out. And he says, okay, just come back to bed. So 
Under our feet is the world of the passions. Over our head is the world of balance and reason. And we operate in this middle ground in between in which the myth of Orpheus takes place. We're tugged in both directions. We don't understand that unless Apollo comes in and says at the end of Orpheus's mad scene when he's lost his reason, he's lost his balance, he is rejecting all womankind, he says, boy, you've lost it. Come with me up to the stars and you'll be in heaven forever. So I think it meant a lot to the philosophers in the Academy of the Inbagiti. I don't, uh, what I think it was a magical surprise because they thought they were going to see a Bacchic ending and what they actually got was something much more magical, much more musical, and much more satisfying in my view anyway. So just before we quit, let us let me think about one other Mantuan thing. And this is a very famous uh, publication by Monteverdi just three years after the first performance of Orfeo. This is the book that contains uh, that famous piece that we tend to call the 1610 Vespers or the Marian Vespers. The uh, sort of blown up title page is on the right and it says, of the Most Holy Virgin, a mass for six voices and vespers to be to be sung by various from by several people, with a few sacred concertos uh, designed for the for the um, the chambers of princes. So it's church music and princely music written by Claudio Monteverdi and dedicated to Pope Paul V. Well, this is a very famous piece, and what I think it is is um, it's a kind of a calling card. It's a kind of a resume. It's a kind of a mm, portfolio of what I know how to do. He's dedicating it to the Pope because he's hoping to get a job out of Mantua. He would like to go to work for the Pope. And this, I think, is his calling card. And he puts in it all the kinds of music that he knows how to write. Um, but I think he puts in it music that he has written over time for Mantua. It looks like it's all new and maybe some of it is new, but some of it is probably not. The Vespers, as you may know, begins with the way all offices begin, Deus in adutorium meum intende, Domine ad adjubandum me festina. But you'll recognize the tune, I think. Deus in If you were listening not to the voices, but to the instruments, you will have heard a bunch of cornettos playing what we think of as the toccata from Orfeo. But I don't think it's that. I think it's the fanfare for the Duke of Mantua. So I think this is very obviously occasional music for use in Mantua. After all, there's no reason uh, to give trumpet music to cornettos. Trumpets have a very limited number of notes that they can play, as I'm sure you all know, at least the natural trumpets of Monteverdi's day. But a cornetto can do anything in the world. So why would you give a stupid little five note tune to the cornetto, who later on in the, in the Vespers are gonna play dazzlingly complicated music. You do that because it's a tune that will that will make its point, and the point is this is a ducal event, and the duke is present here. So there's a beautiful mass in antique Renaissance style, showing that I can write in the style of Palestrina better than Palestrina, and then there's the Vespers that show that I can write music on Cantus Firmus using the Gregorian chant psalm tones, uh, and here's the here's the table of contents for the volume, it starts off with a mass, which is a very big piece. Then there's um, the five Psalms and the Magnificat, which are the standard components of Vespers. They're all in there. Then comes the, the opening versicle, which we just heard, and the hymn Ave Maria Stella and the very cool Sonata Sopra Sancta Maria on the litany uh, Sancta Maria Ora Pro Nobis. And then there are the four 
sacred concertos that here serve as kind of antiphon substitutes between the psalms. And all of them are beautifully accommodated to uh, their texts about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and most of them are antiphon texts. Um, so they work fine in a, in a Vespers for the Blessed Virgin Mary, except for one. There's this piece in here called Duo Seraphim that has nothing to do with the Blessed Virgin Mary and what it's doing in there, people sort of wonder. Well, I'll tell you what I think it's doing in there. Anyway, it's a very, very beautiful piece. It starts with two tenors who say, two seraphim call to each other and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of God, is the Lord of hosts. And it's one of the most gorgeous pieces of music anybody ever wrote. Well, it goes on for a while. And as many of you know, a third singer joins in after a while because it says there are three who give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they sing a oh, holy, holy, holy. And, and it says, and these three are one. So it actually is a hymn to the Holy Trinity and a very beautiful one. What it's doing in here, you might wonder, well, I'll tell you what I think it's doing in here. Here um, is uh, the outside of the Church of the Most Holy Trinity, ordered by Vincenzo Gonzaga, um, because, because uh, for, the, for the Jesuit order, it's near, it's not in, but near the palace. And in this church in 1605 and six, Peter Paul Rubens painted some gigantic pictures to decorate this church um, uh, around the two sides and the far end of the church, as you see there. One of them is a, is a picture of the baptism of Jesus. One of them is a picture of the transfiguration. And the one over the altar, the biggest painting of all is, guess what? The Gonzaga family adoring the Holy Trinity, that pi picture that we saw before. It's now in the Ducal Palace, but it was designed to go into the church of the Santissima Trinita that was dedicated right around the time of Orfeo. It was once a much bigger painting. And here are the various pieces that have been recovered from it, including down here on the left, that little, the little head of Francesco, a uh, little head of Francesco Gonzaga that we saw earlier, the, the um, person who, who was the organizer of Orfea. So it seems to me that uh, the most logical place in the world for a beautifully flashy piece in honor of the Holy Trinity would be for the dedication of this church of the Holy Trinity. And you might even have the Vespers performed there um, with the ducal fanfare at the beginning. I'll never be able to prove it, but it seems to me Monteverdi probably had this piece in his bottom drawer saying, I've got one of the most gorgeous pieces I ever wrote. It's not about the Blessed Virgin Mary, but man, is it good. So I'm gonna stick it in here anyway. So that 1610 publication also, at least in part, is occasional music for the Dukes of Mantua, designed for the people who lived in the palace of the Dukes of Mantua a long time ago. Um, and it's a, place, uh, it's a place that engendered an awful lot of gorgeous music. And I hope it's a place that we all will visit one of these days and think about the sort of bad times that Monteverdi had there and the beautiful music that he made.
So I think maybe maybe we'll just call it uh, call it right there, and uh, and let me see if how can I cannot figure out how to get into Zoom and stop sharing my screen. Uh, if I can't, in any case, that's what I have to say. I'm, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And if there are those of you who would like to make complaints or discussions or think, something like that, I'd be very, very happy. We do have a couple of uh, questions that have been submitted thus far. And if anyone has other questions, you can feel free to, to submit them right now uh, into the Q&A function. Or if you're joining us on uh, Facebook Live, you can put those into the comments there. Um, so I think this was going back to when we were uh, discussing the differences between the libretto and the music. Um, uh, and someone asked the question, would the libretto have been printed before the performance or was it an afterwards? Situation? Oh, good. Uh, yes, the, uh, I mean, we think it was. We have a letter from um, Francesco Gonzaga saying, I have had the poem printed up so that everybody can have it in their hand. I'm presuming that this libretto that I showed you that says this is the Orfeo performed in management you know, is that booklet. We don't, we don't know that for sure, but we know that Francesco's intention was to print the libretto and hand it to people in their hand. So yes, my guess is that even though it said there's this Bacchic ending that changes were made sometime between the printing of the libretto and the performance, or maybe even they always intended to fake out the audience by saying, um, Mr. Strigio is going to write, I mean, he's following the story as given by Ovid, and he is a classically trained poet, and he wants to do it right. In in the classical world, you don't have Apollo coming down in a cloud, you have other things happen. So he tells the story right, and maybe it's Monteverdi or somebody else who kind of has the deus ex machina that cuts the story short. We also had two two separate uh, attendees who wanted to know about uh, Salomone Rossi and uh, whether or not because uh, of his time in the uh, Mantuan court. And uh, we had one person to say, "Would he? Uh, did you know if he would have been performing or performed in the palace?" Um, uh, there's a lot, you know, we need a couple of more sessions about Mantua, don't we? We need to have one about Isabella d'Este. We have to have one about Salomone Rossi, and not only Salomone Rossi, but the very large Jewish community there was in Mantua. Um, uh, Vincenzo was, in a way, a patron of the Jewish community to the extent that anybody was in, in uh in a society that treated Jews very differently from the way we do nowadays. But as we know, uh, Rossi composed a whole lot of very cool music, including a lot of dance music, in addition to those Hebrew Psalms that are so famous. There's a lot of cool dance music and it's in Sinfonia Gagliarde and lots of other good stuff, uh, some of which was presumably performed at the palace. I don't myself know whether Rossi himself performed in the palace. I think mostly court musicians performed in the palace and there were probably many other opportunities in the town for other kinds of music making. And we had a, a question that was actually submitted in advance uh, of, the, of the presentation today. Um, that was asking, what is the history and possible controversy of the Christianization of the last act of Orfeo? Uh, and then they also had a follow up, how many other such composites and plays use similar updating? Well, uh, Christianization is a subject that could be discussed in a number of different ways. Um, uh, a way to start thinking about it is what are they doing doing these Greek myths when they're in principle members of a highly Catholic society with a great big basilica of Santa Barbara about 15 feet away. What are you doing with all these gods and underworld and stuff like that. So the question of how Renaissance people uh, justified um, their admiration of classical uh, the classical religion, while being in principle practicing Catholics is a big question. Um, uh, then there, are, there is the argument that there is that there's something uh, Christ-like in some ways about the character of Orpheus, the idea that he's somebody who goes down into the underworld and rises from the dead um, with the help of a god from above, and not the rising from the dead, but then, then ascends into heaven. There is a kind of, uh, you could argue if you wanted to, and if maybe if the cardinal were there, you'd say, oh, well, actually, it's all just a big metaphor for 
Jesus. Um, uh, whether they actually saw it that way or not, I'm not sure, and, and how people justified the one and the other. I don't myself see in the correspondence that I've seen or uh, commentary, of which there isn't much around the time, any overt acknowledgement of the Christian, the possible Christian or Christ-like parallels between Orfeo and, uh, and, and the, the story of redemption. But um, it seems to me perfectly plausible. And it's something that would, if it occurs to me, it probably would occur to a whole lot of other smart people alive in Mantua at the time. Uh, another question, uh, looking at the uh, the original room and thinking about Apollo's descent, would it have been possible that there was any kind of machinery involved with that uh, descent of Apollo? One of the one of the problems about the ending, uh, uh, there are some people, the great Nino Pirotta, I think I'm getting his view right, is that they changed the Apollo ending to the other ending because they couldn't fly in Apollo because the machinery didn't work. Um, uh, or you couldn't build a machine in that little room. That... Maybe. I, I, uh, let me put in a plug for a wonderful book called First Nights, which is about the first performances of five famous pieces of classical music. And one of them is about Orfeo. And in that book is a picture from a 17th century stage, um, stage machinery manual that explains how to fly somebody in without having something overhead. Uh, how to fly some, how to fly how to make a flying machine, a cloud, a chariot, or whatever it is, without going up into the roof, and it's done by having a lever sticking out, you know, a lever sticking out sideways. Um, so, uh, in principle, it could have been done. So that's not a good enough reason to say the Apollo, uh, uh, the Apollo ending couldn't have happened. Well, and speaking uh, of of the room, we had a question. With with the number of forces, particularly in terms of instruments, um, how how did that work to fit that uh, into the room? How do you think? It is hard. We know uh, among the things we know. One of the things that's really great is that uh, in the score, Monteverdi gives a whole lot of little stage directions, and they and most of them are done in the past tense. That says this ritornello was played by uh, two recorders of something and a partridge and a pear tree. Not should be played by, but was played by. So he's saying who played what, he doesn't give it for everything. And there's also that big, as you say, David, there's that big list of instruments at the beginning, including a whole bunch of string players. We also know that there were instruments behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, because there are some places that say, this ritornello was played from within by five string players. There are two five-part string bands in Orfeo. People say that because there are 10, 10, uh, string, 10 strings listed in the instrument list and only five parts for the strings. This is the first orchestral music because they were playing two on a part. They weren't playing two on a part. There was a, there was a band of five out front and a band of five backstage. Uh, who else was backstage? I don't know. But as you know, they don't really all play at the same time because the violins stop. And then in acts three and four, we have trombones and cornettos and regal and organ. And so we have a switcheroo. And there might have been actually some people filing out of the room to go have a couple of beers uh, while the while the infernal acts were going on and then coming back to play the to play the uh, happy dance at the end. Um, we don't know exactly where everybody was positioned, but you're quite right that there were a lot of musicians, a lot of instrumentalists, um, and it would have it will have been a tight squeeze. And someone uh, also brings up uh, and maybe makes an interesting connection here, and you might uh, see what what your uh, knowledge of this is. They said Monteverdi wrote his uh, lost opera, uh, Ariana, the next year. And this uh, question, uh, the asker says, my understanding is that it does have a Bacchic ending. And any chance he used the Bacchic version of the Orfeo ending in Ariana? That would be cool. I, I, yeah, I don't. Of course, we don't know because the only music of Monteverdi that we have is the is the lament, the famous lament um, uh, of Arianna herself. That is an opera in which finally the Duke, allowed, because it was for a big public occasion, 
uh, uh, the Duke allowed uh, female singers to, to uh, perform in Ariana, thank goodness, because the role of Ariana is such an important one. The role of Eurydice, if you think about it, is tiny. It's very, very beautiful, but very, very small. But Ariana is a major, major figure. Uh, I don't know, gosh, I hope everybody, when they're wandering around in bookstores, will just keep an eye out and see if you ever come across a book that has a bunch of music in it and it says Ariana on the title page. If it does, please call me up and we'll look at the back together and see whether the back ending sounds like it could fit to the words of the end of Orfeo. Well, and and uh, you were just mentioning uh, the uh, women in singing. And uh, so we had someone who, who says uh, Rossi's sister was an opera singer. Yet uh, you made the case uh, just now for Castrati and Norfeo, at least. Do we know when women were allowed to begin performing on stage in Mantua or elsewhere and what the parameters, social class, religion, etc., for that were? Uh, we, when you say we, uh, there may be people who know a lot more about this than I do. I don't. I do know that for things that were big public events, and, and generally things were either put on for sort of a carnival thing, uh, the Orfeo was for a small, a small learned audience of gentlemen, uh, not it, so it was not really a public event, even though they gave a second performance that they hoped ladies of the court could be admitted to. Um, but Ariana was for, you know, it's for a big noble wedding, or, or the, you have carnival things where you have a play and you put intermedi between the acts of the play and you do it outdoors in the big public garden or something, and in situations of that kind, um, at, at least by the next year, uh, Duke Vincenzo was willing to allow his court singing ladies. He had a bunch of ladies sort of in imitation of the singing ladies of Ferrara, but he didn't let them sing in Orfeo. Um, but, but as to exactly what you had to be, I don't know. The people who sang in Ariana, as far as I know, were uh, ducal employees. So I, 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 and I don't, I, I don't know much more than that, but I know there are a couple of good biographies of Salomone Rossi and there's some good, there's some very good work on music in Mantua uh, in, in a much larger scale that would probably help answer that question. Well, and I think that's uh, all the questions we've had, and we're, we're right at an hour. I want to thank you uh, first, uh, Tom Kelly, for a wonderful presentation uh, and giving us lots of lots of details of and feeling like we're inside uh, inside the palace ourselves. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, David. Thanks. It's been fun. Hello, everybody in Early Music America, and goodbye. And uh, we hope that you all enjoy uh, join us in two weeks uh, for our next uh, Monday evening session. We'll have a, a, a practical oriented session with John Tyson, who's going to be uh, presenting on Renaissance improvisation. And so that is at 8 p.m. Eastern on Monday, the 9th of November. And you can find information about how to register for that on our website, earlymusicamerica.org. You can also find the event on Facebook, uh, on our Facebook page. And so uh, for Early Music America, we want to thank everyone who has joined us this evening. And we'll be archiving this session on our YouTube channel as well if you want to go back and, and dig uh, even further into it and, and refresh your memory about anything that happened this evening. Uh, so once again, thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again next time. Thank you.